I'm not going to give you the perspectives of Tim Quinn. It's hard to avoid that because that's who I am. Uh, I, I am going to try to speak on behalf of my, my, my association. Uh, we are the only statewide political entity that engages in California water policy other than the governor and two United States senators. Everyone else has their own geographic provincial perspective. Uh, and as I'll explain a little bit, I, 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 I answer to a very diverse board and I'm going to try and give you the perspectives of that group of people which think differently about California water than a lot of our constituent uh, elements. Um, uh, just quick background on Aqua, we're a little over 100 years old. Uh, I represent a very large number of, uh, of pu public agencies, 440 public agency members in the Association of California Water Agency. We're the largest association of its kind in the country. Uh, we, the, uh, Aqua's members are mind-bogglingly diverse. Uh, they are ag, urban, north, south, uh, you know, uh, above the uh, rim dam watersheds and uh, the agricultural users on the on the on the valley floor, and they deliver the vast majority of the state's water. Uh, of course, they always agree with each other, so my job is really easy. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, the way we resolve differences is with this group of people. The, the, these are the people who could hire and fire me. On a, they hired me and they could fire me on a moment's notice. I work for a board of 36. I'm not going to go into the gory details, but basically they represent 10 regions around the state of California. They never forget their differences, uh, but they, the reason they're on, my, on the Aqua Board of Directors is they want to find common areas where they can agree despite their differences. And it's my experience when I can get my board to agree, we're not as powerful as some of the big powerful uh, water agencies that, 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 that spend billions of dollars on infrastructure, etc. But when you can get the Aqua Board to agree on something, you've probably got something that looks looks like it could have some legs under it as a statewide policy. And that's the perspective that I'm going to speak from. I don't pretend to represent all of those 440 agencies. It would not be hard to find people amongst them who disagree with uh, things that uh, we say and do at Aqua, but I can fairly say that I represent the views of that very diverse body that works hard to come up with statewide perspectives on California water issues. Um, and as Jay mentioned, we are dealing with a system that is much changed from the beginning of my career. That's a picture of John Kennedy and Pat Brown, the father of the current governor, at the dedication of San Luis Reservoir in 1963. Uh, uh, it was an era of building big things for a big growing economy. There were no apologies for it. Recently I read the speech that Kennedy gave uh, uh, at San Luis that day, and for a water manager and infrastructure guy, it filled, uh, it, 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 uh, it fill, it filled me with pride th thinking about the system that we're operating today. But that's system, of course, underwent some enormous changes. Uh, I, I like to point out that the year water started moving into Southern California, they passed the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in, in the, state, uh, the state legislature, which basically blew a huge hole in the water supply element of the 1957 plan that all those contracts were written around. That's followed by Endangered Species Acts, uh, Clean Water Acts, uh, dozens of court decisions interpreting all of the above, managing the system under climate change, which wasn't imagined uh, back when the contracts were signed. We're operating a system under dramatically different rules than the rules that were established for us uh, when contracts were signed and commitments to pay. Uh, that's not a complaint, by the way. Uh, I, I've been a part of the policy developments that have tried to match those changes over time. First one I'll mention is the Bay Delta Accord. Uh, this picture was taken on uh, December 15th, 1994, I was standing uh, right next to the cameraman uh, that took that shot. The, the Accord was the first statement on a statewide basis that we had to move away from the policies of the old towards what we now call co-equal goals. Uh, it, 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 it didn't last as long as, as some would have liked. It was followed by the CalFed process, which you will hear belittled a lot. CalFed deserves a lot more credit than I think it uh, gets. It was part of the learning process uh, as we move towards the future. Uh, this is Phil Eisenberg, who I understand came and spoke with you last week. This is Phil in his incarnation as the chair of the what we call the Delta Vision Task Force, uh, which were volunteers. Mr. Frank is uh, uh, here and uh, pictured up there. The, uh, uh, the, in 2008, they came out with a, a visioning document, a strategic plan that was truly remarkable. Uh, five years earlier, it couldn't have been published or they would all been run out of, uh, out of the state on a rail. Uh, that was followed, actually not followed, it was preceded by, I think, the single most influential academic piece of work that I've ever read, and I'm a, I'm a PhD economist by 
training, uh, you know, public policy analyst uh, wonk uh, until I actually got into the uh, water industry uh, after 10 years of being wonkish. Uh, and I, I, in my career at the Rand Corporation, I wished I had written something as influential as this. As when I read this for the first time, I was a 25-year grizzled veteran, and it changed how I thought about how I looked at uh, water policy, particularly with respect to the Delta. All of those things over a 20-year period uh, built the found whoops wrong direction built the foundation so we could pass comprehensive legislation. This was the biggest deal in 50 years, arguably the biggest deal ever that the California legislation has done on water. Uh, a series of bills passed in 2009: the Delta Reform Act, which was uh, Senator Steinberg's bill, uh, th four accompanying bills, including a water bond, uh, which didn't tell you where to go with respect to all the Delta decision making, but laid a foundation that would give you the ability to get there if you had the will and the knowledge to do so. Uh, my organization, so four and a half, not quite four and a half years ago, my organization still believes that that 2009 legislation is the, is the, is the rock we can stand on to move forward. Uh, it is built around the concept of co-equal goals, not a new concept I'm sure uh, to virtually all of you in this room. This is the definition of co-equal goals in the Delta reform Act. Coequal goals means the two goals of providing a more reliable water supply for California and protecting, restoring, and enhancing the Delta ecosystem. We'd been moving in this direction for at least two decades, but it came a, became a formal statement of law. What we do with it remains to be seen, uh, but I still think it was an evolution of law that was absolutely essential, and this is the, the, this is the, the, this is the cornerstone around which California water law revolves today, and we're seeing if we can find a way to make it work. Now, I'm going to stay today at the 50 to 100,000 foot elevation. If you get down to 5,000, there's a whole a lot of bickering going on. This makes a lot of sense to me at the 50 to 100,000 foot elevation. If you have questions at lower altitude, I would be glad to answer them. Uh, probably dinner would be a good place to do that. Um, uh, let me go into a little bit about the, what co-equal goals means from, again, at, the, at a very general, co-equal goals means comprehensive solutions. I like to say you have to check the box next to all of the above. Absolutely massive investments in local resource development to keep local supplies up, demands for imported water down, that's true. In the Bay Area, it's true upstream, uh, in the upstream areas above Sacramento, it's true in Southern California, it's true everywhere. We have to be committed to unprecedented investments in local resource development. We also have to be uh, invested in and I meant that to come up earlier, sorry. Uh, in in, uh, uh, in uh, conveyance solutions, I, you know, it, it, it's the, uh, the, the thing we, that we fear the most, but I don't see a path, and I'll make a strong case for this later, towards coequal goals if we don't have the courage to deal with the conveyance problems in the Delta. Uh, Aqua believes you have to, have to add storage, both surface and groundwater storage to that long term, to get a system that can truly respond to coequal goals. And comprehensive ecosystem management, by which I mean, the kind of thing that your folks at the, at the UC Watershed Center talk about, not species by species, problem by problem, but standing back, taking a bigger look at, at multiple species, multiple stressors, multiple management tools, uh, approaching the ecosystem management the same way we're trying to approach water supply management in the state of California. Uh, I want to emphasize that I'm going to spend five to ten minutes at, uh, on an optimistic note. We have made more progress than we give ourselves credit for. Uh, you know, let me start with local resource development. Uh, investments that go far beyond what we appreciate in both urban and agricultural areas. So we have recently did a cooperative study with, uh, with the Department of Water Resources, a conservative estimate of the supplies generated by those local resource developments. It's not building big dams on mainstream uh, uh, rivers. This is local resource development involving some storage uh, has created about 1.9 million acre feet of water supply over the last decade plus. Uh, uh, th that has cost six billion dollars, part of it state incentives through bond incentive payments, but the vast majority of it from water agencies doing what they do, setting their water rates to pay for resource uh, development that they believe is important to their future. But to put that in perspective, in the last decade, we have, through local resource development, created something that's got the same yield as the state water project, which was considered a pretty darn big thing in 1960. Uh, it, it, and, and what we have been doing, playing little ball with supply, has been pretty impressive when you add it up and look at it. Uh, uh, in, again, most of that being powered by local decision making, local agencies, aqua members, and others. Uh, turning to, we haven't ignored storage. There's been a very substantial expansion of south of Delta storage. I don't, not nearly enough to manage a system, but more than we sometimes give ourselves credit for. Extensive groundwater banking. I spent 10 of the most 
interesting years of my career in Kern County uh, developing storage partnerships. He, uh, Jay referred to it as, as, as storage marketing. I didn't think of it that way at the time, um, but huge successes uh, of, uh, of, of stakeholders south of the Delta expanding groundwater storage. But they, of course, get sued and, and are still in court over it. Uh, Diamond Valley Lake, my former employer, uh, largest surface storage project in uh, western states in quite some time. Las Vaqueros Reservoir, not too far from here. Uh, water banking in Lake Mead, I spent 10 years trying to negotiate it and failed. Roger Patterson, after I let, ha left, had it done in a year. I like to think I, I gave him a good foundation to work on. Um, but if you add all of it up, it's hard to sort of, how do you, how do you put a, a number on, on Lake Mead, for example, but a pretty conservative estimate, we've added at least 4 million acre feet of new storage capacity, surface and groundwater, to the system south of the delta at a cost of about $4 billion, actually probably considerably more than that. And to put that into perspective, that's like adding a Shasta Lake to the system over the last uh, uh, 10 to 15 years. Again, a remarkable accomplishment as we've moved in the direction of more diversified investments uh, uh, d d than, than we did uh, in the past. Um, uh, very quickly, regional Aqua members and others have been, from a regional perspective, putting co-equal goals to, 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 to life from the Yuba River to the American River to uh, the Tuolumne River throughout the state of California. I need to add some Southern California examples of this, my staff told me today, because they're doing the same thing on the Santa Ana River with the SOP agencies, et cetera. A lot of progress being made in local uh, uh, systems for that, that work for both local water supply and local uh, fisheries. And I, the California's emerging water market, I couldn't resist putting this on. Jay mentioned uh, that I, I have something of a history in water market for the first 10 years of my career, it's about all of it I did. I worked for a very far-sighted man named Carl Baronke, one of the true giants of California water who doesn't get the credit he deserves. But one of the things that, that Carl had a fascination for was the market. Uh, he heard me give a speech once when I was at the Rand Corporation saying we need a peripheral canal and a market. Uh, he liked it, so he hired me. Uh, and, uh, and he said, go make that marketing stuff happen. And let's just say that didn't make you the most popular person in the world to be coming from Southern California saying we've got a great idea, we need more marketing, fuel uh, online reservoirs. That wasn't an idea that caught on quickly. Uh, but I was uh, I was a reviewer rec on a recent uh, Public Policy Institute of California report and was very pleased to read that, they, that, that PPIC could document about 2 million acre feet a year in annual uh, trades uh, this year. So not nearly as big as it needs to be in the long term, uh, but again, a sign of enormous progress. Um, Okay, now that's the good news. I want to start transitioning to more controversial uh, issues because one of the things, that, it's got to go beyond just adding more tools to the toolbox. We've got to think differently about those tools. And by the way, I want to emphasize, I'm not going to ask you at all to buy into any conclusion today, not a single one. I am going to ask you to think differently about problems uh, than you might have in the past. Some of you maybe not, but uh, uh, most of you, yes. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, Aqua has launched a few months ago something we call Rethink in California water to try and get people to look differently at water issues. This was one of the pieces in that uh, series. Uh, it was an a, 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 a editorial over my signature. Uh, my staff actually, I, I have the concepts, they write it, I edit it, but they deserve more credit than I do. This came out, this was in the, in the January 8th uh, San Francisco Chronicle, asking people to think differently about the technology of water. Now I'm not going to argue technology is the only thing that counts, but boy does it count, and I'm going to try and make that case uh, in the next 20 minutes or so. I only had 600 words to do it here, so I'm going to take more than 600 to make the case of uh, why we need to think differently about technology, infrastructure, the fundamentally important role that it has in accomplishing a world of coequal goals. And to try and convince you, some of you may have seen me do this before, I apologize. I want to start here. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to this place. <laughs> You recognize this place? This is the new intake as in came online in 2005 of the city of Sacramento. It's where they get their water supply out of the Sacramento River. If you haven't been there, I would really encourage you to do so. Uh, it, it, the Richards, Richards uh, uh, Boulevard exit on I-5, real near downtown uh, Sacramento. Get off at that exit from either direction, turns toward the river and you drive a quarter of a mile or so, you can't miss it. It's clearly visible from, uh, from the street. Uh, Aqua took a tour out there. This is a magnificent piece of infrastructure. It's probably 100 to 150 feet wide. It rises 100 feet out of, the, out of the river. It costs $33 million to construct. Uh, its capacity is 160 million gallons a day. It's taking care of the substantial portion of the needs of the city of Sacramento and getting their water supply from their senior water rights on the Sacramento River. Now, what really struck me 
me that day was not so. I, I see lots of big pieces of infrastructure. <clears throat> if you're standing out on this walkway to that infrastructure and you turn to the right and look upstream, this is what you'll see. This little humble hunk of concrete, which was the old intake for the city of Sacramento. Couldn't have cost 10 cents on the dollar for what the new infrastructure takes. And I, I looked up and I asked our guide that day, I'm an economist, not an engineer. Uh, I said, well, what's the capacity of that little hunk of concrete out there? And the answer was 160 million gallons a day. From a water supply perspective, those two pieces of infrastructure are identical. They provide the same service, one doesn't do more than the last. The same capacity in both of them. Uh, the difference is co-equal goals. Uh, on the left, you have something that was designed for fishery needs as well as water supply needs, uh, and that accounted for the vast majority of the capital expenditures. It had to be big because the screen had to be big to keep the flow velocities down, to keep the fish away uh, from the screens so that you could operate your system in a way that was consistent with the integrity of the ecology that you were a part of. I would also point out this structure didn't cost the city of Sacramento a drop of water. They continued to, 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 to flow as much water through it. It was an infrastructure, it was a technological problem, uh, not a water flow or water supply problem. Absent the facility, you could argue there's a flow problem. They pulled water out, they pulled uh, smolt out. Uh, that could be a flow problem. This was a flow problem that was fixed with an infrastructure solution, and I want you to hang on to that concept. Not that I can sell everything that way, but, uh, but, but it's a lot more important than it oftentimes gets credit for. Um, uh, and by, by the way, uh, another thing I learned in this process is co-equal goals are really expensive. They're a lot more expensive than that old single goal of cheap water. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time, partly because of, uh, of professional pride, I spent a lot of my career in a place called Butte Creek. I mentioned the Bay Delta Accord. Uh, the court had four categories of agreement. The third category was investing in habitat restoration for the first time in the history of California water uh, management. And interestingly enough, that was something that we water supply agencies fought for. The environmentalists were very indifferent to it. They wanted to continue arguing around fl about flows, but the water community felt very strongly that there had to be a habitat element to the Bay Delta Court in 1994. Bruce Babbitt went around me to my boss, a man named Woody Woodrask, and said, okay, you want to put your money where your mouth is? How do we make habitat happen if we don't have money? And would Rasco wound up giving $30 million of MET money, no strings attached, to make the Bay Delta Accord? I was the lucky guy that got to decide how that money got spent. And uh, one of the places we spent about $5 million was in a place called Butte Creek. Another place that's really a, a joy to go watch if you want to see California water uh, progress in action. I have, uh, Butte Creek is up near uh, Chico. I have two grandchildren in Chico. They're now, oh God, 11 and 13. Uh, and I have, uh, not every year, but I'd say every other year, I take them out to watch spring one salmon spawning on Butte Creek. They couldn't do that before. The, the, these are pictures of the system before restoration. Uh, Butte Creek it was 25 miles from the Sacramento River up to uh, where the, you run into uh, boulders that are so big nothing can get, can get around them except water. Uh, and uh, over that 25 million, 25 miles, there were 12 dams multiple uh, uh, outtakes to irrigate rice up there. None of them were screened, uh, and it was a killing field for spring one salmon. This is the traditional habitat for spring one salmon. By the early 90s, uh, 170 or so adult females were getting up to spawn compared to the thousands before. Uh, the another thing really unique about Butte Creek was the water managers up there are genuinely invested in co-equal goals. I can't say that about all water managers, uh, but it's, it's a growing phenomenon and it certainly was true up there. They also were looking at fairly muted Endangered Species Act threats, although there were no actions being taken on Butte Creek at the time. They had a progressive, uh, uh, the, 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 water, the primary water district up there was called Western, it still is called Western Canal Water District, and its GM was a man named Gary Brown who tragically died shortly after these projects were completed, who had the vision to drive the process. And what happened was a complete rethink of that system from one end to the other. Uh, all 12 of those dams were modified in one way or another. Uh, this is after restoration. If you look, let me take you back here. Look at the upper left, that's Western Canal Dam. And that part of the river today looks like the lower left picture here. Uh, the dam is gone, replaced by a siphon. I wanted some pictures of infrastructure, the top left 
uh, th that dam is gone, and what replaced its functionality for the water supply system were three 10-foot pipelines that siphon water under the river instead of parking it in the river and having a, a diversion structure called a dam. And now the farmers got a better water supply system, and the fish got, in the end, 25 miles of habitat back. Uh, didn't cost the farmers a drop of water because the, their flows coming out of the system weren't the problem. The problem was the infrastructure designed 50 years before that wasn't designed for co-equal goals and when we started thinking co-equal goals we started getting co-equal results. Um, uh, again, in, uh, on, on Butte Creek it was an unprecedented partnership. There was urban money there. There was uh, the state, the federal governments were both engaged. Uh, four dams were removed completely. Uh, there have been 12 dams. Four were taken out and the other eight were replaced so they actually had state-of-the-art fish uh, ladders that the fish could actually climb up. I've got a couple of stories about that, but I'll save them for later. Um, uh, the diversions were all screened. None of them had been screened previously. You, as I mentioned, you, the 25 miles of stream were uh, uh, with un unimpeded flows with suitable habitat, and the spring one Chinook salmon population was, I think, fair to say restored. This is what the population diagram looked over time. Uh, when we started thinking about Butte Creek, the populations were on the left. Uh, by the way, you'll note that the, there's one big bar there which I had knocked down. Uh, I, I, I know you can play games with bar charts. I'm not intending to do that, <clears throat> but I remember vividly uh, the year we had 20,000 uh, uh, females return. This was the first year that the, 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 it's the first year you should be looking for them because the, the projects had gone online three years before. They're out there for three years. They come back and we got 20,000 back. I was thrilled and the biologist told me don't be thrilled. We've only got spawning capacity for about half that number. So they weren't thrilled. Uh, and we started, they started managing the system for the five to 10,000 range and but for the fairly serious drought that happened uh, not too many years ago, they've been meeting those targets far and above what they were before. Uh, again, a, a success story. Flow wasn't the problem here. It was the infrastructure. It was the technology that we were using to manage water. I'm not arguing that flow is never the problem. Just a lot of times it's not, or at least not nearly as important as, uh, as some may think. Uh, elsewhere on the river, uh, the, the, the same thing has been happening on a, a, a higher dollar scale, but, but, but a less comprehensive scale. That's East Bay Mud's new Freeport intake facility, $120 million. Again, for, for the amount of water it moves, it's only moving 350 cubic feet per second. It's a huge facility, about the same size as the Colorado River aqueduct pumping plants, which move 1,800 cubic feet per second. It's so big because it's designed for fish uh, as much or more than for water supply. East Bay Mud could pay for its uh, system, uh, less true for Glen Clusey or District, a $75 million screening facility. Uh, this is a Reclamation District 108. I could come up with another dozen. The Sacramento River is pretty well screened at this point in time. One point I want to leave you with, these are expensive facilities. Co-equal goals are expensive. My urban members can generally eat the public uh, benefit costs. My ag members cannot. Those ag facilities would not exist today but for public subsidies that were aimed at bringing public interest values into infrastructure decision making at the local level. Enough about the Sacramento River, I want, to, I want to talk a little bit more controversially, I suspect, about uh, the other river, the San Joaquin. I'll talk about Frank Dam. Uh, from a perspective of, of co how do you think about Friant Dam and the San Joaquin River from a perspective of co-equal goals? Well, they got a head start on it when they negotiated a major settlement agreement that nobody seems to like anymore. Uh, it's because co-equal goals are really hard. <coughs> And the, I guess the, the, the little very brief history about the San Joaquin River, the Frank Dam came online about 60, over 60 years ago. It was built for low-cost water supply. That was the name of the game in, in the 1950s and 1960s. Well, low-cost water supply meant take that water out of the San Joaquin and move it immediately left. The water never saw the river. Uh, it moved directly from the dam, as you're seeing there with that red arrow, <coughs> and moved into the Frank Kern Canal, which is a big facility. The Frank Kern Canal is 4,500 cubic feet per second. That's three times bigger than the Colorado River Aqueduct, you know, like uh, uh, 10 times bigger than the LA Aqueduct. This is a big facility designed to move lots of water. All of that water made an immediate left turn out of the uh, Frank Dam in, in order to get water down on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley, which was the main reason that the project was built. Worked well for the agricultural economy, 
didn't work so well for the San Joaquin River, particularly the reach above the Merced River, uh, where at times the river is completely dried out because it's been deprived of flows. Uh, and so, of course, the environmentalists sprung into action. The environmentalist view of success is take the farmer's water and run it out to the Golden Gate Bridge, which I guess would work okay for the fish, would not work okay for that farm economy. There's a concept that doesn't get much respect, and again, I'm not asking you to buy into it, just to think about it, but in the settlement agreement, a concept that has no legal force, the NRDC, who was the environmentalists at the table, weren't about uh, to agree that it should happen, but they agreed that they could think about it, uh, and they called it recirculation. You know, recirculation is illustrated up here where water is not di moved directly left out of the Franklin Canal. Instead, a, a portion would be, would be doing that. More of the water would be going down the San Joaquin River to the Delta and then be pumped back through the California Aqueduct to maintain water supply. Now, the, both of the, the flow patterns I showed you before, one side or the other, critical goals get sold out. Uh, now maybe that's the best solution for society, uh, but the, the one that can keep supply going to the farm economy on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley and has a hope for restoration is this recirculation of what my good friend and one of the most brilliant people I ever worked with, Dave Fullerton at the uh, Metropolitan Water District, he said the water's got to go in the big circle if, if you're going to accomplish co-equal goals. Uh, of course in the big circle there's controversy, there's expense. To make the big circle work you need storage. Uh, somewhere in the system, I, I, I tend to be a fan of Temperance Flat, don't run out of the room now, just because uh, Temperance Flat is both above and below the delta from a manager's perspective, very, very flexible asset for managing flows for fisheries and then capture, timing withdrawals out of the delta. You'd ha you have to have billions of dollars in habitat restoration, that line should be a little bit further upstream on the San Joaquin or to the south, uh, but, but you, if the flows won't do you a darn bit of good if you don't match it with massive habitat investments again, particularly from Fryant Dam down uh, to the uh, confluence of the Merced River. You have to have a fixed delta if you're going to operate the delta for the big uh, cycle and you'd have to construct a fairly sizable inner tie between those two big systems that have got maybe a couple of garden hoses between the two of them. Uh, the California Aqueduct in, the, in these reaches is running 10,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, the Frank Kern Canal is still 4,000 plus cubic feet per second because the Frank's biggest contract of the Arvin Edison Water just, just Arvin Edison Water Storage just reaches at the very tail end of the system. They don't have any meaningful connections to allow you to interconnect the two and operate them on a Whole. Again, I'm not trying to argue for any of these investments, but from a co-equal goals perspective, I don't see you, how you could not think some of these thoughts, try and put some numbers to them, and figure out what, what pattern of investment makes the most sense. I mentioned fixing the Delta. I'm going to use the rest of my time on this awful place that uh, experts here at UC Davis have spent a lot of time and ingenuity thinking about. <coughs> um, the Delta is... Uh, Again, I know you're, most of you are familiar with it, this vast, flat place <coughs> where you know, water moves in whatever direction you pull, you, you pull it from the system. Uh, and uh, it, it is the elephant in the room of California water policy. You couldn't talk about the Delta in an intelligent way for 20 years. Uh, and if, if, if Jay and colleagues had written their 2007 report in 1997, uh, they'd be teaching elementary school someplace t uh, uh, today. Uh, and that's because uh, it's a killing field politically. Uh, I mean, g getting sensible policies out of this place is really, really difficult because emotions run so high, reason runs so low. So why did these two guys go wandering into that political kill killing field? Well, I think the governor said it pretty well because there's big problems there that have to be fixed, and they're trying to do it through the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. Again, I'm going to stay at the 50,000 to 100,000 foot level of elevation. I, the, I, I don't agree with everything that's happening in the BDCP process. Sometimes it's a little too uh, export-centric for my perspectives, uh, and I represent a statewide association, but it's hard to imagine a system co-equal goals uh, uh, really being highly effective without solving this problem one way or the other. Um, here's the way I like to think about it. You've got this huge footprint of a multi-billion dollar water supply project. We might as well get out of that existing footprint what we can. It's about 600 reservoirs, uh, pumping facilities, 666 miles of, 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 of tunnel or aqueduct. And the BDCP 
is, pro is proposing to lengthen that 666 miles by about 35 miles, 5 to 7 percent. Uh, they're moving the intake. I know that you'll read in the newspapers it's a vast increase in the ability to move water in Southern California. Simply not true. Matter of fact, it's a reduction in the ability to move water to, uh, to Southern California from a, uh, from a lot of perspectives. You got 15,000 cubic feet per second of pumping capacity in the South Delta today. They could turn it on today in theory. They don't because they obey the rules. But trying to convince Northerners that they'll obey the rules is not necessarily an easy uh, task. Uh, but we're talking here about moving the intake for a number of reasons as, as opposed to a dramatic increase in expanding the withdrawal capabilities of the system. Uh, and I haven't shown this kind of, and maybe we should be more, I haven't shown the arrow diagram how water gets to the California economy. Here's the problem that we're trying to solve. This is, this is the current so, so oversimplified view of hydrodynamics uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Quinn's perspective. The big rivers in the north and most of the water we pump is coming from the north because it's such a big flat place when you turn the pumps on, it pulls the water from where the water is. The water's up on the Sacramento River. 80% of inflow to the, in, into the delta on the average. On the San Joaquin, it's second biggest river in California, smaller, and that water is getting pulled into the delta pumps too because it's a big flat place and the water goes where the pumps are. Um, and, or, or the water can move around the delta in what we call uh, Q West flows. We were arguing a lot about that uh, 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 15 years ago. None of these flows are good for fish. Uh, they're there because it was a low-cost way to deal with water supply before the fish mattered very much. We basically treat the Delta as our water highway in the state of California. I know they're proposing pipelines today. Well, the Delta is a virtual pipeline today. We don't actually have a real pipeline, but we treat the Delta as it was a pipeline. And if there's one thing I learned in 2007 from the, uh, that PPIC book is the Delta can't do all this stuff and accomplish critical goals. You have to decide. Uh, and my frustrations with recent proposals for very small facilities, etc., is the Delta continues to have to do all of those multiple tasks. If you want the Delta to function for critical goals, the most important thing to do is technological, is infrastructure. It is to isolate those two water uses, the environmental from the economic, to give yourself a standing chance to deal with the risks that remain, and those risks, in theory, should be enormously smaller. And that's what they're trying to do in the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, which has four key elements. I picked it, sometimes I pick the maps. This is the, the scary picture. This is when I wish I had the, uh, the, the little uh, uh, beamer thing. Uh, if you look at that picture, that, that's a tunnel boring machine. And there's a little speck in the lower right hand side of the tunnel boring machine, that's a man. This is 37 foot uh, uh, capacity. This is big infrastructure. And I suppose if you were an environmentalist in the Bay Area, you'd be scared of it too. Uh, uh, we're not talking small, we're talking big infrastructure, moving water supply for a big economy, especially moving water supply when you've got lots of water to move. That means you need lots of capacity. Uh, we need to match that with storage uh, south of the Delta that we don't have today and they don't talk about or think about much. Uh, but one element coming right out of there is the governor's tunnels, 35 miles, two 37 foot tunnels, 35 foot, I guess, uh, he's, he's saying now, so they shrunk a tiny bit. Um, that is coupled with very aggressive aqu aquatic habitat restoration. I don't think, frankly, one of these works without the other. You need to get uh, humans and human and, and management for humans out of the delta so you can manage it for habitat purposes. Another lesson I learned in 2007. You have to address all the stressors, although they don't get enough credit, I don't think, for being willing to address all the stressors. Things like, you know, the, the, the uh, waste management in, uh, up, upstream of the delta. And a very strong commitment to local resource development. I think they, they need to keep standing on the parapets and shouting that, that they're going to keep demands down for export water uh, while they fix the export system. <clears throat> and that's something that will require policy and vigilance on the part of the statewide government because uh, the, the, uh, the, the export interests need to be, you need to make sure that they're going to be doing that. I think they're willing to do it. We need a system though that assures that it's going to happen. Uh, one thing that's left out of the picture at the BDCP table that's important to Aqua and particularly our upstream members is more storage. I couldn't resist quoting the recent NRDC proposal. It's a great pro-storage quote. If you're an environmentalist and you don't want to walk away from the system and pretend that this economy is going to drop and go away, you should be a storage advocate. Uh, the export interest should not be storage advocates. It's an added expense. They don't get more water out of it. It just changes when they can take water. Uh, the, the advocates for storage infrastructure as part of critical goals 
ought to be the people who care more about fish because it allows you to shift your water demands uh, from times of higher conflict to times of lower conflict. And uh, you know, uh, my organization's consciously made a decision not to do anything that interferes with the successful Bay Delta Conservation Plan as long as it's working for the state as a whole and not just for export interests. Uh, but before we are done, we're going to have to take storage a lot more uh, uh, a lot more seriously in the Delta than we have to date. Um, that's basically the, again at the 50 to 100,000 foot level. Uh, this is a vision we can at 5,000 feet. There's lots to argue about, but it's a framework that we can build on. My organization believes uh, that it's the framework we need to build on. I want to talk a little bit about some of the obstacles for can we get there from here. Um, and I'm, by the way, known as the world's biggest optimist in California water, deservedly so. My mother raised me that way, and she did a hell of a good job. Um, but here, you know, here are some, some questions that have to be answered in order to get where we need to go. Uh, th th three questions. One is, uh, three key questions. One is, will the federal government get it? A huge variable out there. The second is, can we build statewide support? And we, and we really have to start looking to statewide support, which hasn't much happened to date. Uh, and third is, can we pay for it? Now, let me give you Aqua's brief answers to those questions. Uh, well, keep trying to keep it brief. As far as the federal government, I, I would argue, not everyone would, uh, that they got it more or less in the 1990s. Um, I saw more of Bruce Babbitt than I did my wife in the 1990s. Babbitt was a Secretary of Interior, a strong environmentalist, and he absolutely believed you need to show that the Endangered Species Act could work in California on water supply. He devoted himself to the Bay, uh, not to the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, that came a decade later, uh, but Bruce was there all the time with policy guidance to try and make sure that this thing worked for what we later called co-equal goals, the term hadn't been coined yet, uh, and again, not to perfection, but but you had this very conscious guiding hand from the federal government to not allow the biologists at the GS 7 and 9 levels to, uh, uh, to, to wreck the works. Uh, part of the success in the 1990s remains to be seen. Whether or not that will happen in 2012, well, there's a lot of hopeful signs. Uh, but the jury is still out. We'll, we'll know in the, over the next, certainly at the course of this year, we'll know more about where the federal government's coming from. Salazar is going to get a new uh, replacement. We'll have to see where they're coming from at that point in time. And my organization thinks it's absolutely essential that, that as you move forward and implement the Endangered Species Act, which is what they're doing with the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, you have to keep your eye on the co-equal goal, uh, uh, co uh, goal bar. Uh, that means uh, I, I like the reconciliation concept that's been coined uh, by PPIC scientists where you've got to reconcile environmental eco ecological goals with, with water supply reliability goals and it's something that has to be demonstrably working for the state as a whole uh, and, uh, it, and for water supply reliability as the state as a whole. I certainly believe there's ways to do this but again there's huge, huge discretion, big variable out there with what the federal government will actually do. Can we build statewide support? Well, it will not be easy. Uh, it, the, delta, delta, the Delta is the killing field uh, pol politically. And it's not just, it's not just the, the, the third rail of water politics, it's a third rail of politics in the state of California a lot of times. Certainly for Northern California populations, uh, uh, politicians. <coughs> My organization believes there is a path to success and, and that they need to do more than they are doing today to make it very clear that the BDCP has to be successful, but only as part of a statewide plan that's working for the state as a whole. And that it's got to, again, to use that phrase, uh, reconciliation, or uh, it's got to clearly demonstrate that you can reconcile uh, the Delta ecosystem with water supply reliability. They've got to find a much better way to deal with managing risk. Because I'll tell you quite frankly, these arguments over are they going to get this much water supply or 400,000 acre feet more or less, th 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 I'm I'm not really interested in the answers to those questions. I don't think they're technically accurate or interesting. I want to understand how can we deal with risk in the future? What system is more resilient? What system will allow us to deal with differences of opinion more in the future? That's a much harder thing to quantify and to sell in a, in a policy environment, but that's what you're paying $14 billion for in the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. In my heart of hearts, with 30 years of experience plus, I believe that once you make these physical changes, just as was true on Butte Creek, just as was true elsewhere, you've got a physical system that is much more amenable to reconciling the differences between the, uh, the environment and water supply reliability and I believe that is worth an investment of 14 billion dollars. Can we pay for the 14 billion dollars? It's actually more like 40 billion dollars when you add it all, all up to 14 billion. It's just for conveyance solutions. If you look at everything we need to do in a comprehensive solution, <coughs> excuse me, it is easily, I'm going to take my first uh, drink of juice. It's easily a $40 billion solution 
over the next quarter century, which is a very, very small number for a true two trillion dollar a year economy dealing with arguably its largest infrastructure challenge. Uh, I just don't buy the arguments that it's too expensive. Uh, not true before, not true now, won't be true in the future. But we do have to struggle to find a way to pay for all of this. One reason for that is when we switch to co-equal goals, we need to switch our financial paradigm uh, to match a, a system of co-equal goals. Co-equal goals means you're broadening the mix of services when you bring an infrastructure project online. It's not just producing cheap water. We knew how to finance that. You found where the water was going to go. You said, do you want this water? Will you pay for it? And they would say yes, and they would pay for it. Project finance, but we're now producing something that produces water supply goals along with an array of public benefits uh, uh, for co-equal goals, and those public benefits uh, are, are getting linked to water supply benefits, and we need to find a way to finance both of them. Uh, reliable public funding sources are going to be essential for the future. As I said, some of the urban agencies so far have been willing to swallow uh, the public benefits and load them on their uh, rate pairs. I don't fault that, but I also don't think that it's the, that it's a uh, that, that it's a recipe for success in the future. In the package passed in 2009, the answer to the public finance challenge was a general obligation bond. $11 billion broken into th three pieces, if you aggregate them the way I like to aggregate them. $4 billion was for habitat and watersheds. $4 billion was for local resource development. $3 billion for the public benefits. It was an attempt to carefully define it, although uh, arguments persist, uh, for, uh, for additional storage. And all of that money was expected to leverage another 20 to 30 billion dollars in private capital, by which I mean not state funds, uh, 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 local public agencies, et cetera. Um, my organization strongly supports the, 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 uh, the bond when it was passed. We believe that it would be good to pass something very similar to it in the future. On the other hand, it was on the 2010 ballot and we pulled it. It was on the 2012 ballot and we pulled it. It's now on the November 2014 ballot and we're starting to think uh, as we head into the legislature this year, is a 100% geo bond strategy the best way to go? It may be, again, I work for a 36 member board of directors who like that bond a lot, uh, but they are willing to look at alternatives. Um, and we're going to have to. This is going to be a big issue in the legislature this year. There have been four bills introduced to date, three in the Senate, one in the Assembly. Uh, it's very clear that we're going to have to restructure the water bond. The degree to which it will get restructured is not clear. My own view, I think the view, view of my board of directors is, okay, let's hang on to the policy agreements that we had. Again, this would not be a universally held view amongst uh, AQUA members, uh, members. Let's hang on to the policies that we, that we need to build a future on, but figure more innovative ways to finance them. And we're willing to talk about changing finance, but not dropping out major elements of the comprehensive solutions. Um, the governor certainly is pressing hard. And I've, I've <coughs> I go back to George Dick Majan working with governors on water issues. And uh, Dick Majan washed his hands of water after Duke's Ditch in, uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, Wilson was a pretty good water governor. Uh, although my boss thought he was an ag water governor, and I think he was probably right. Uh, Schwarzenegger was, uh, uh, Davis I won't talk much about. Uh, Schwarzenegger, uh, because he thought it was good politics, good for his image, he was a very, a, a, a pretty active water governor. We have never seen anything like Jerry Brown. Uh, his father built this system, he wants to make it sustainable, and it's a fire burning him whenever you're around him talking water. It's very clear this is something, we, we've got the highest level of engagement of the chief executive officer of the state of California that we've had until you go back to his father, and he's going to have to match his father's will and, and, and willingness to put his political capital up on water. Governor Pat Brown, Water was almost everything to him at the time. He put his entire political uh, uh, capital portfolio into water, and guess how much the Burns Porter Act passed by in 1960? Less than six tenths of one percent of a vote. Uh, uh, so I mean, you need a governor to be invested in this issue, uh, and even then, e even then, you're facing a high level of political risk. Um, for Aqua's part, we're looking. We've created a finance task force. Uh, that it's exploring avenues to maximize our prospects for general obligation bond financing, which is a very, very appropriate way to pay for public benefits. And I would argue almost all the money in the bond was for, you have these little pork arguments, but the vast majority of the, of the bond is not affected by those arguments. We need to depork the bill, uh, cut the pork out, probably downsize it, figure out alternative ways to finance some things. Uh, and I've got a, a, a task force of my board members to keep me out of trouble when we're looking for creative ways to do that. Uh, one way or the other, uh, 
this is going to be a really incredible year. The next few years are going to be incredibly active years on contentious, people are going to be saying bad things about each other, but I never would have thought we'd have the opportunities that we've got today to move forward with California water policy. What I wanted to do today was not to convince you about any particular solutions, but to get you thinking differently, in particular about the role of infrastructure and technology uh, in those solutions, because I don't think you can get there without radically changing uh, the system we inherited. It's got to be, uh, we're, going to, we're going to spend tens of billions of dollars to retrofit it so that it is consistent with the policy of co-equal goals instead of just being there to deliver cheap water. I don't know how much time I left for questions. Quite a bit. Yeah, we've got a good time. Some. Questions. If you have any. Any questions? The speaker always feels better when he gets questions. Back left. Let me uh, get the microphone to you and can have this immortalized. <clears throat> uh, first of all, thank you for a very well thought out and educational presentation. Thank you. Uh, secondly, uh, if you divert all that water from the Sacramento River south through these tunnels, what is going to be the effect on the remaining Sacramento River north of that diversion and on the water level in the San Francisco Bay? Well, the effect on upstream on the Sacramento River, no effect. Uh, there, 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 I would also argue no effects on San Francisco Bay, although you do get a change in the mix. What's happening here, and it raises significant issues, is the exporters are not taking more water. They're not looking for more water. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, the, uh, the, I was actually the person who wrote the No More Water Policy for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. The board adopted it in 2004, 2005, and what it said then, flat out it said, we're not looking for more water. They we're looking for the same amount of water through a more resilient, more reliable system. And they got that. And now, of all of the, uh, even, even the, 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 the ag contractors involved in the Bay Delta Conservation Fund, nobody is looking for more water than they had available to them when they started the BDCP process in 2006. So the, 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 let me drive that point home. This is not about vast increases in water. It's about changing where you take it. Uh, it and it would change taking it from, it, now uh, the pumps are located on the Little River, on the San Juan Joaquin, and they take a lot of San Joaquin River water, pulling Sacramento River water down across the delta in the process. What they want to do is get more Sacramento River water to, uh, the, to, to, into the California aqueduct, which is good for water quality, it's good for water supply, it's good for the fisheries in the delta, it's good for emergency preparedness, it may not be good for water quality in the delta, and that's an issue which I'm going to want to look hard at, the EIR that's about to come out. I think that's a very legitimate issue, affects some aqua members. They've got to deal with the fact that if you're getting more Sacramento River water and less San Joaquin uh, River water, the delta, the, the bay is getting about the same amount of water. Uh, it's getting a different mix, but I don't know that that matters all that much once you get out into, into Susun Bay. They're better expertise than I am around here. But there are impacts on people in the Delta because they're going to get more San Joaquin River water, which could adversely affect them. And that's something they there are there are solutions to those problems. They need to be identified. They need to be identified and mitigated. Well. One of the hypotheses that's been that's been come up by, by 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 your faculty members at the UC Watershed Center is that we need more variability, and and you, you need to get the human uses of water out of the delta so you can experiment with more variability. This would open the door to be able to do that much more effectively uh, than 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 if you're sharing the, the the surface system that we got now as a pipe. Question here. So my question, maybe it, you kind of touched on it for a second when you talked about. Um, could, could you speak up a little bit? I'm 61 about, years uh, old. The hearing's not good. Emergency management, and um, one of the things that uh, I've come to understand that is a high risk of uh, having an, an earthquake in the Delta region. What is the ranking in terms of, uh, from your perspective, of that risk? Um, what sort of uh, the, there's been a lot of I've read economic reports coming from Southern California at the, the prospect of flow being cut off, like six to, to 24 months um, in, that, in the case of that event. And then also, uh, in terms of co-equal goals, in response to a, a disaster like that, how uh, coming from the, the reservoir 
Tirid, I can't remember the name, um, that, uh, that you were talking about feeding not only the Delta in terms of flows for fisheries, but also the southern San Joaquin Valley. How do you, how do you set policy responses to those sort of disaster management? I'm, I'm hearing multiple questions. I mean, if, I, if I don't ask all, answer them all, give him the mic back so he can ask me the questions I didn't answer. Um, emergency preparedness, clearly the superior solution from the economy's perspective is to, is to isolate yourself through a tunnel that would be less vulnerable to a uh, major outage due to earthquake. Um, and th th there are other ways to solve that problem, by the way. I mean, storage south of the Delta gives you the same uh, cushion of the same benefit. Uh, the, I, I think there needs to be more thinking and planning into ecosystem emergency management when that big system happens. Uh, what, what can you do now that, 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 that helps the ecology to work itself through such a traumatic expense? And again, I don't know to what degree that's going to be reflected in the, uh, in the EIR that, uh, that comes out. Here, I'll get my in trouble with some of my membership who, who may be watching this at some point in the future. I personally, the, 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 in the South, they play the earthquake card big because it really sells to the business community. The business community is scared to death. They watch Katrina, they watch other stuff. And I think it's a legitimate, perfectly valuable argument. But even without that, look, the main driver here is the interface on a day-to-day, -day, week to week basis between our environment and our water supply system, because we've trapped ourselves in a world in which we have the worst possible situation and neither side can win. So even if it weren't for the earthquake arguments, there are very compelling reasons to want to make some of these structural changes. Although the earthquake arguments, as I said, there, I, I've noticed in the last week as the, 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 the letter wars are continuing, uh, earthquake is the first argument that comes from the water supply interest. Again, it's a perfectly legitimate argument, but, but, but frankly, the risks you face as a businessman in Southern California are probably greater from the fact that you've got a system in which you're pitted against the environment and you go into a court where the environment's the only thing that counts. That's going to do more damage to your uh, water supply quicker uh, than an earthquake will. Both legitimate arguments. Back here. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I'd like to know what the major impediments are to the recirculation plan for the San Joaquin Valley, and why hasn't that been proposed for the Sacramento Valley also? Well, I'm not sure if I understand the question with respect to the Sacramento Valley, because you just don't have the same challenges there. They. Uh, uh, rapidly, they're they're adding up to the same problems. Um, we're not getting <coughs> as much down the whole river. We're taking more river water out of the river before it ever gets in the river. This is the uh, perennial problem on the San Joaquin, and it's starting to happen more and more as the diversions get larger and bigger with sh raising Shasta, etc. Uh, I've heard of uh, proposals to build a canal straight out of Shasta instead of putting it through the river. I think the best co-equal goal you could pursue is keeping as much water in that river as possible. And that's not happening, at least not from what I'm hearing. And so I'm curious, <coughs> I like the San Joaquin system recirculation. I'm not sure how it's going to work. And that's why I want to know what the biggest impediment to that is. Uh, and then your thoughts on the Sacramento system. Uh, do, on the San Joaquin side, um, again, I'm not trying to convince anybody of what, what the right answer is. I think the main difficulty of getting up on the table, and I, you know, the, the Frant unit are very serious about recirculation. It's, you know, the, they've lost their water. They'd like to get some of it back. Recirculation is how they see themselves uh, doing it. They understand its value uh, in the concept of co goals. So there's a very strong base of support within the Frant unit, and it sort of dies elsewhere. Uh, and I think the main reason it dies is, everybody, is it's so hard to get people to think co goals. Uh, and you know, right now, everybody is afraid if they move to a, a regime where, where they're willing to adopt the, an objective statement that's reflecting co goals, they'll have to give up something that they might be able to hang on to uh, if they hang on to their own unilateral uh, goal perspective. It's hard to get people out of that world into co goals, the, I, into one where they're actually thinking about co goals. I spent most of my career trying to get people to think about co goals uh, and uh, have had some successes, some failures, and you can make a strong case that, uh, you know, I wouldn't, that, that uh, as, as you're out there, I used to tell my staff, war is easy. Uh, you, you just throw bombs like everybody else and you say the same dumb stuff everybody else is doing. But your job is safe, your paycheck is safe. Peace is hell, Con, you know, consensus is hell, because you have to leave your pack, think differently, say different things. And every time you do that, you wear out some of your credibility with your own pack. 
And I think it's that dynamic that, uh, that prevents us from getting these things. But I also think we need to work through it. On the Sacramento River, I'd like to talk to you more just about your, your ideas about, because uh, I do with, uh, agree that we need that water to do as much as it can for both the environmental uses. Uh, if, for, if we're going to build Sites Reservoir, for example, don't take the water out upstream, let it stay down to Knight's Landing. You do have a problem with the expense. I mean, that becomes very expensive. And I think that leads you to what is a public finance strategy for making sure that we get all those values is incorporated in, in, in an infrastructure project. So there are, now that I think about it, there are some parallels I hadn't thought about. All the questions are in the back. <coughs> uh, I'm curious if uh, BDCP has actually accomplished. Do you think that climate change and sea level rise will indefinitely reduce water exports in the future regardless? I don't think anybody knows, we don't have enough data to know what climate change is ultimately going to do to water supply. Uh, I, I think something that you will find looked at in the BDCP is they have been looking at climate change and at mitigating the po possible effects of climate change with respect to conveyance issues. So uh, they'll, you know, I'd be surprised if they don't locate their intakes at a place where it's, it, it's much less vulnerable to rising sea tides and things like that. Uh, you know, my community strongly believes that as you look at the changes in the variability of precipitation and snowpack levels, et cetera. We need to look at storage solutions to, uh, to climate change. I don't think they've done that now. And it, uh, over time, will climate change add or subtract from water supply? Well, given the last 30 years, I got to guess, uh, let's hedge against the bet that it'll reduce it. Almost everything else does. It's not intuitively obvious to me why, but why it necessarily would, though. Here, we're moving to the front. It seems like a lot of the uh, resistance to the Bay Delta plan uh, is that the infrastructure would put in place certain governance decisions before those go before you know the public feels those governance decisions have been made. Um, in the cases of things like the you know the, the large projects you showed where they were screening, how were those decisions made historically? Were they made before that project went in in a public fashion, or <coughs> were they kind of? Was the public dragged along because the financing was in place? For something? Really, a good question. I mean, when you put a big screen on it on a diversion up in the Sacramento River, there aren't real operational questions. You're going to operate the same way you did. It's just the water is going to flow through a screen. The fish are going to be protected. There aren't real operational uncertainties that uh, emerge. The Butte Creek example I gave, there was, there was no real change in operations. You were just changing where the water had to go because you only gave it one path to go under Butte Creek instead of through Butte Creek. And we and everybody knew that would work for water supply and it would work for. The the environment. In the Delta, you've got these huge operational questions, and uh, everybody likes to talk about uh, 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 about you know adaptive management over time, uh, but 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 no one comes up with a credible way to do it. Nobody trusts the other guy's science. So we'll look at the door right now are the Endangered Species Act decisions that are taking water supply away because of the way the Delta functions. By the way, the ESA decisions that have been made, none of them are about outflow to the, well, I guess the, the, the Accord had outflow elements for uh, X2 considerations. But for the most part, the big losses in water have been because the old and middle rivers, the, those two, the highway I showed you that's old and middle river, OMR flows are negative. And that's been, and regulating those negative flows has been what's costing huge amounts of water which you fix with your structural solution. So I, I'm convinced that my, that, that Aqua's export members over time, I, I don't fault them for being very focused on conveyance today, but over time as we start to look at the system as a whole, they, they, they need a system that works long term. And I think, over, I think over time the storage element will get merged to the conveyance, uh, conveyance elements. Because by the time they're done negotiating BDCP, they're not going to get big dryer flows in, uh, dryer flows because you've got to have negative, uh, or even, even if you get a big isolated facility, doesn't help you that much when it's critically dry. Because the Sacramento River doesn't have that much water to give you when it's critically dry. And the minimum bypass flows for the fish on the screens are sufficient that virtually all the water is being taken care of in minimum bypass flows. You don't have a lot of water to put into the upper end of that isolated facility when it's dry. Uh, in early drafts of the administrative drafts of the EIR, which were just out there as rough drafts and they distanced themselves from it, you had some very big dry air uh, negative OMR flows because they were trying to get supply out of a system that couldn't really give it to them. Uh, I don't think you'll see that kind of uh, activity being permitted. And the more that happens, uh, uh, the more attractive storage is going to be for moving supply around to when we can actually take advantage of it. Not to mention the flow and temperature benefits for fisheries that storage can provide. Good question. Additional questions? No more questions. 
wore them out. All right, I guess it's about time for uh, great. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for. That